and welcome to Out of the Blue number 61. Um, today we're going to take a little bit more of an academic approach. Um, I'm going to read from a few books. To start with, A History of Writing, Stephen Roger Fisher. From the preface, one sentence, he says, All modern society rests on writing's plinth. Plinth. Rests on writing's plinth. Just in case you didn't know, a plinth, the slab, block, or stone on which a column, pedestal, or statue rests. Plinth. So we've been talking about, I mentioned the idea of a, of a worldview as a thought machine. Um, and this is a worldview in mind, Eugene Webb. And uh, I'm going to start with just this little blurb here. It says, um, when worldviews clash, the world reverberates. Now a distinguished scholar who has written widely on thinkers ranging from Beckett to Vogelin inquires into the sources of religious conflict and into the ways of being religious that might diminish that conflict. Now, right away I want to say that um, the conflict we have now is not exactly religions conflicting. It is, it is religious people versus irreligious or non-religious people. So the question really is not how for religions to get along, but how for the religious and the non-religious to get along. We have this happening in Germany today. So, now from the introduction, The Power of Worldviews, page 1. No human being lives without a worldview, but comparatively few ever give much thought to what worldviews are, how they come into being, how they change, and how they are held. Now this is very true. It's difficult. I mean, since a worldview is something you don't even really know that you have sometimes, um, it's difficult to get people to uh, think about them and talk about them. So that's kind of my problem I have with this series. And it's kind of like Annie Bates. Maybe you saw the movie uh, um, Fried Green Tomatoes. And Annie Bates has that precious scene where she says, I can't even look at my own vagina! <laughs> right? And, um... Getting a person to look at their worldview is like is like getting any base to look at her own vagina, right? <laughs> it's difficult. Um, so I want to say that we, the Western world, live in essentially a neo-Kantian worldview. So you're on my shoulder, you're over my shoulder, and the question is, are you a devil on my shoulder or are you an angel on my shoulder? But, um, so, I'm presenting Neo-Swedenborgianism as a world view, and, uh, Swedenborg and Immanuel Kant were contemporaries. And we currently live in a Neo-Kantian world view. So let me just, this is a book called The Story of Philosophy by Will Durant. Chapter 6. He says, Never has a system of thought so dominated an epoch as the philosophy of Immanuel Kant dominated the thought of the 19th century. Right? And he goes on to say, he, he, he kind of history, does the history of since Kant, but then he says, These were secondary and surface developments. 
underneath them the strong and steady current of the Kantian movement flowed on, always wider and deeper, until today its essential theorems are the axioms of all mature philosophy. So we live in a neo-Kantian worldview, and things like Carl Sagan and uh, the space race going to the moon, um, this is all suggested by Kant. He suggested astronomy in the 1700s as you know that as the as the epitome of of human thinking astronomy and ethics so so now in our current day we're faced with this uh, a problem of the Kantian worldview conflicting with a what you might call a pre-Kantian worldview or a theistic worldview and the neo-Kantians think that all that was proven wrong essentially even Kant wrote a book about Swedenborg and uh, claimed to disprove and defeat Swedenborg but that was only a claim he claimed to defeat him which is to say to beat him or to to lick him he thought he licked Swedenborg in this book and history the uh, history of science um, supports the idea that Kant licked Swedenborg and people today um, continue to try to defeat Swedenborg in this Kantian way so basically people like that I refer to as Kant lickers because they are using Kant's way of of beating or defeating or licking um, an opponent. They're Kant lickers. For instance, Penn Jillette has, uh, you know, he's famous for for spouting, you know, bullshit, right? That's Penn Jillette's catchphrase, and that's Kant licking. So Penn Jillette is a Kant licker. Now, here I'm looking at this thing that says worldview equals thought machine and what we have happening today and it's really brought into relief in Germany right now which is to say that the pre-Kantian worldviews, the theistic worldview is kind of like a, um, sand in the gears, it's a monkey wrench in the working of the of the Kantian worldview so if you look at a thought machine, I mean sorry, if you look at a worldview as a thought machine um, these machines can break down and they need to be they, they need to be maintained but what we have now happening is that the neo-Kantian worldview which 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 has done great things don't get me wrong you know the 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 Mars Explorer is an outcome of the neo-Kantian worldview and the Mars Explorer is a great thing the Hubble telescope is is great and it's an amazing thing and I fully support this. But what's happening now is the neo-Kantian worldview is 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 having difficulties difficulties with the fact that the pre-Kantian theistic worldview still exists. Because the neo-Kantians basically think that they defeated them back in seventeen ninety. So why are they still here? And how do we deal with it? And can we somehow fix the neo-Kantian worldview to incorporate the pre-Kantian theistic worldview? And I think the answer is no. I think the answer is essentially you need a new worldview, which is what I'm calling the neo-Swedenborgian worldview. Now, Swedenborg, um, if you read about Swedenborg, he claimed to travel to heaven and hell and wrote about it and he fully believed that that was really happening but we the neo-Swedenborgians you know because Swedenborg sat in his in his uh, room and meditated basically was thinking about it so it seems to us that he was just traveling in his head and so the basis the basic premise of the neo-Swedenborgian worldview is that um, thoughts are things and the imagination is a place 
Now, this is not is not an original idea, but in many ways it's a revolutionary idea. Thoughts are things, and the imagination is a place, which is why you can... People say they got lost in their imagination, or they traveled in their imagination, or you take a journey in an imagination, because it's a place. So, this is symbolic, this little cube, it's a one centimeter cube, one centimeter cubed, is, is the, basically, the afterlife. Because if you read them in, in different writings, they suggest that heaven is a cube. Have you ever seen this? It's like the Borg ship. The Borg ship is a cube. Swedenborg, Borg ship, is it a coincidence? I don't know. So, this is symbolic of heaven. This is the symbol, the cube, is the symbol of Neo-Swedenborgianism. So, and ancient peoples thought that the considered G-O-D, God, as the prime cause. And the cube, the heaven, pre-existed prior to earth. And God made the earth and all that, right? But now we live in this Darwinian evolution, natural selection world, scientific worldview. But the problem is, the heaven scenario has not gone away, right? People still report seeing heaven, and they still have these experiences in their life, hundreds of people every day, where they think they're going to die, they're about to die, and they visit Grandma in heaven. And, as we've already said, the Neo-Swedenborgian defense stipulates that it is not objectively real. Okay, there is no objectively real place outside of ourselves where we go. But it is subjectively real. And we, our lives, human life, our experiences, mine and yours, are subjective. So it has been established to be subjectively real. And what this does is it creates... it. Okay, we accept Darwinian evolution and natural selection. Yes, that is correct. And this means that God is not a cause, but God is an effect. So natural selection has created in humans this subjective experience of never dying. Okay, subjectively. We may objectively die, um, but we don't live objectively. So if you objectively die, it doesn't really matter if... In fact, subjectively, you live on. So you may die, but you'll never know it. Because you, subjectively, have the scientifically verifiable, mind you, possibility of subjective eternal life. And so, I wanted to establish this now because a lot of what I say going forward is is going to be based on this premise, basically. Thoughts are things, the imagination is a place. And that essentially changes everything. It takes this heaven world as a cause of everything, and it turns it into an effect. And this is because, I mean, this has to be addressed because it hasn't gone away. We're now hundreds of years after Darwin and Kant, and it hasn't gone away. So it then, if you want to be theistic, you can say, well, that's heaven, that's the afterlife, that's where you go. But Neo-Swedenborgianism is not a belief. It is a rational worldview that concludes that this whole experience that Swedenborg had, and all these other people have, it's in his head, and I have a head too, and I, I expect you probably have a head. <laughs> and so this whole experience is in your head and my head. And that worldview then encompasses both the pre-Kantian theistic worldview and the neo-Kantian scientific worldview. So what is necessary for all this, for, for our world to take the next step, is the adoption of a new worldview, the neo-Swedenborgian worldview.